Greetings and welcome to In the Trees, the cannabis gardening and lifestyle podcast highlighting methods, products, growers, and breeders from Maine, the East Coast, and beyond. I'm your host, Mr. Roots, and I'm stoked to deliver you the lowdown on all things cannabis, presented not just for the well-vetted OGs in the garden, but for those buying a seed pack to grow their very first garden. This show is especially for those buying their very first cannabis to try. If you are listening in your car, sit back, relax, and strap on your seatbelt. And if you are listening in the garden, turn us up so you can hear us over the fans. Sending out good vibes from the rock-bound coast of Maine, we are in the trees. Stony Stories are brought to you by Frass Valley. Frass Valley is an organic, super worm-based garden amendment that I personally have used a bunch in my garden. It has a balanced NPK ratio and a lab-tested level of ketin at 16.9%. This means that it aids your plant in building its immune system, increasing beneficial microorganisms and mycorrhiza in your soil, while also discouraging soil-borne insects who might be looking to prey on your garden. If you are looking for an amendment that will help you grow strong plants, Check them out at Frass Valley on Instagram or go to their website, frassvalley.com, to order some today. Listeners of the show receive 10% off their orders by using the code words in the trees at checkout. Wait till you see what Frass Valley's Superworm Frass can do for your garden. Welcome to the first of many special feature episodes of In the Trees podcast. These exciting episodes are designed to provide you with more stony stories, growing tips, professional opinions, advice, and reviews on everything the cannabis community has to offer. This is the case with our first special feature, one of In the Trees podcast's stony stories told by the notoriously entertaining main storyteller, Crash Berry. Crash Berry is the author of the book Marijuana Valley, as well as the critically acclaimed novel Sex, Drugs, and Blueberries, which was made into a feature-length movie starring Maine's own Dave Gutter from Rustic Overtones as lead actor. He also penned the intrepid memoir Tough Island, his drug-fueled homage to his times as a lobster boat sternsman out on Matinicus Island. Great read. And for you audiophiles who love quality podcasts as much as In the Trees does, Check out Crash's true crime podcast, Devils and Dirtbags, as well as his journalistic coverage of the COVID pandemic, Open Ears, Maine. Crash interviews local Mainers as the pandemic unfolds and discusses how it affected their lives and community in real time, both personally and professionally. Right now, we are proud to bring you something special for your listening enjoyment. Here is the one and only Crash Berry on In the Trees podcast. Crashberry getting into some High Striker Farms cherry strudel for this. To warm up. Stony story. Stony stories. I like this feature on your show, Mr. Roots. So I'm, I'm very pleased that you invited me to tell you a stony story. And basically, there's, I only have two stories because the rest of my life is entirely high, right? So it's like they're all stony stories. And the, the first story is maybe two sentences. When I was 10 years old, a traveling carny got me high for the first time. That's not the story I'm going to tell you, though, because I think you're going to enjoy this story about the United States Coast Guard. So I was in the Coast Guard as a young lad. I was in the Coast Guard fighting the war on drugs and fighting the war on Haitian refugees. This was back in 1988 is when I joined. And uh, I was a young punk. And I didn't want to join the military, but I needed to escape my not-so-great life at that time. I dropped out of community college and 
I'd gone out to Cali for a little bit and nothing. I just ugh, I was a loser 19-year-old by that point. So I joined the Coast Guard because it was like the military, but not like the military. Like I wasn't going to have to go like kill somebody. But then it turns out I joined when Ronald Reagan was president and we were involved in the war on drugs. And the Coast Guard was the police department of the war on drugs. And the police department patrolled from Maine to Mexico on the East Coast, actually Gulf of Maine. Bay of Fundy all the way down. And I was stationed aboard a cutter uh, that was on the border of New Hampshire and Maine. On the river? On the river. So but, as an aside, was there a steady stream of Jimmy Buffett playing? I fell in love with Jimmy Buffett during that time period. So yes, uh, we had a lot of Buffett uh, on on cassette tapes. Yeah, <laughs> on a boombox that we would listen to. So when I was stationed in Portsmouth on a 210 foot cutter, we were supposedly focused on the waters off of New England. But because of the war on drugs, they wanted to beef it up down in Florida and the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico. So they would take our ship and send it down to Florida. We would drive our ship to Florida. Uh, God knows how much diesel you went on that commute. And it was a, like a four or five day commute on this big ship, 24 seven down. And it's a crew of 80 guys. And then we would be involved in the war on drugs in the Caribbean, which involved we'd have a helicopter on board our ship that would go out and look for drug boats. And we were always searching for the, the mothership. As we hear that term in, in drug smuggling a lot, the mothership. But we were always looking for the mothership. And the mothership is this ship that would have a bunch of weed on it and smaller vessels would go out to the mothership and get the weed. We just, you ne we never found the mothership. Nobody ever found the mothership. <coughs> That's what you call the leading seaman, uh, which is like the one that drove the boats, painted the ship, handled the ropes. I, I was a sailor and I was really good at it. I, like, I'm really good at that sort of stuff. I'm like a terrible military person, right? So on one hand, like I was very, I had the great jobs, uh, very sailorly jobs. But the other hand, I was never going to get promoted anywhere because I'm just not a company man, right? But it was a good thing for me. It saved my life, I'm sure. I probably would have ended up in prison for some stupid crimes, you know, drug crimes back then, I guess. I don't know. It saved my life and it brought me around the world and I saw lots of stuff, including on these many trips to the Caribbean, uh, we would have usually a three, maybe four day patrol break, mid patrol, because we could go out somewhere, it's like 24 days, 25 days, we'd have to resupply. So there would be a patrol break because our patrols were like two months long. So we would be in some exotic foreign port of call all around the Caribbean. But I preferred it when we went to for instance, the Dominican Republic. And that's where this story takes place. So I'm 19 years old, Dominican Republic. And at this point, we've been able to identify our fellow pot smokers in the deck force, the sailors, the seamen, the low rates. 18 to 25 year olds like me. And you get, I'm sure you, uh, you know this, uh, you can usually identify someone, even if they don't look a certain way, you, you, there's a vibe, there's a, like a pot radar, right? Imagine trying to trust that pot radar in the 1980s during the war on drugs and you're a coasty, as we're called, and there's drug tests on occasion, especially if, if they view you with any suspicion. So you're able to suss them out though, right? And so there are three other guys that smoked weed, even though we're all, you know, fighting the war on drugs. And we find ourselves in the Dominican Republic. It was a six day patrol stop as opposed to like a three or four day because of some extenuating circumstances that someone was going to transfer us, who, who knows. But we we're there for a while and I was able to trade my duty the day that you'd have to stay on the ship with a couple married guys. So I had six days off in the Dominican Republic and I had like a couple thousand bucks on me, right? <laughs> Sounds uh, like a good time. Right? <laughs> but I mean, but it was, you know, a beer like was one peso 
and it was six pesos to the dollar. So like you could go six beers for a dollar, right? This is 89, I would say. So anyways, we don't want to hang out where the Coasties are because we want to party. So I, I find a fellow, a local guy, I hire him as a guide for like saying, hey, you want to come on vacation with us? And me and my posse travel to another town in Dominican Republic where we have to get on a bus and then a taxi. So we're, we're, we're far enough away to have the distance between us and the Coast Guard, but still close enough because theoretically, if there's a hurricane or something, we, or somebody drowning, we would have to cut our vacation short. You have to be within like, I think, a three hour zone. So we're like an hour and a half, two hours away from the ship. We had a great time. I ended up getting a lot of weed. And then we're going back and the guy that we got some weed from, he goes, you guys want to bring with you? And we're like, oh, we'll go back to the Coast Guard ship. And we all look at each other. We had been to school and taken classes on how to find secret hidden compartments on drug smuggling vessels, right? So we knew all the tricks because they taught <laughs> they taught it to us, right? And, you know, a, a, a hastily made decision to, yes, we'll get a quarter pound of weed, okay? And back in the day, that was a lot of weed, a quarter pound, four ounces of weed at once. Like, you never saw that unless you were in the biz, right? Like, you would, as a consumer, at most, buy a lid. You would never buy a quarter pound. People buy quarter pounds all day long now, but back in the day, you wouldn't do that because there's supply, demand, all that stuff. So, you know, the guy shows up with a quarter pound in a paper bag and, you know, everybody's eyes go, whoa, look at that, look at all that weed. And we split it up, no scale, right? We just visualize it, and each one of the four of us coasties got an ounce. And the rule was, you're going to go hide it on the ship. You weren't going to tell anybody. You weren't going to tell any one of us. We would all keep our location secret until we got back up to New Hampshire, and we're not going to talk about this. We're, we we were so serious. I mean, I'm not sure the listener gets it. It was serious. It was like you were not supposed to do this. Right. The 80s were, were very trying times for cannabis and you could go to prison, like you were saying. And then there were commercials that were constantly being aired about, this is your brain. Yeah. This is your brain on drugs yeah. with a cracked egg into a frying pan. Oh, there was oh, a lot of propaganda, propaganda going on that could have been targeted at certain specific drugs, but they targeted cannabis with the same line of reasoning. Oh, yeah. That it was equally as addictive, let's say, as heroin. And at that time, the Coast Guard would board fishing boats, and if they found a seed, they could confiscate your fishing boat. If they searched a crew member's locker and found a joint, not the skipper, not the owner, they could confiscate the boat. It was part of the search and seizure, and we did it all the time. The Coast Guard did it all the time. It was a tough time. Well, a joint would get you in trouble. So... <laughs> Here we got an ounce of peace, and we go back on the ship, and we have a drug dog on the ship. Okay, we had the Coast Guard's first drug dog, and we'd had a trial drug dog from the DEA, where we were the trial DEA drug dog with a DEA handler on it, and we would feed that dog hamburger, steak, whatever. We loved that dog. You weren't supposed to feed it that stuff because back then, one of the training mechanisms for drug dogs was a bland diet to keep their nose clean. Whether that's the case these days, I don't know. The technology, you know, training's changed, all that stuff. And we always used to joke after that DEA dog left our ship and went to like Atlanta, work at the airport or whatever. Like anybody that was bringing sausage back would get busted because <laughs> it loved the sausage so much. So then they, for whatever reason, the Coast Guard decided to put a drug dog on our ship. Onyx was her name. She was a black lab. The handler was a bosun mate, a guy I knew who was wicked hammerhead, terrible lush. And we would have uh, uh, events where let's say they'd bring school kids on. They'd say, look at the drug dog. And then uh, they would do a demonstration where all the kids would be on the bow of the ship, the forecastle. And uh, they'd bring out Onyx, the drug dog, and they'd release Onyx, and Onyx would like walk around and then go to a toolbox that had a bag of weed in it, right? It had the same toolbox. It was like she was trained to go to the toolbox, not the bag of weed, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? Every time we put her on a boat, a sailboat, she would shit, right? As soon as she got on the boat, <laughs> often. I mean, obviously, not every time, but many times, right? On a fishing boat, that's not a big deal, but when you get to board a sailboat, 
and the the drug dog shits all over your boat. That's right. <laughs> so we had to get back on our ship past the drug dog, right? But it's like she's my friend. It's like, hey, baby. Ah. So, anyways, we all get back on the ship separately, and we go stash our weed in our own compartments uh, in our own special secret things. Okay, one guy, he cut into the insulation in the helo shack, a special compartment. It was like this insulation on the wall. It was white. He cut into it, pulled it back, stuck the ounce of weed in, taped it, painted it so that it was camouflage, like mud and, pa- uh, mud and tape almost. But he, he made it so you couldn't tell there was any problem. Another fella uh, went down to the bosun hole, the forward most compartment of the ship, down into the paint locker and into the bilge and stashed his ounce of weed down there. Nobody would go down there. You just wouldn't. There'd be no reason to go down there. I took my ounce of weed, and in the laundry room, there were these lockers that had false bottoms, because in my training, they always told you, look in the false bottom of the locker, because that's where the stash will be. They also would tell you to measure the compartment to make sure there's no false walls or anything. So I just I looked at this thing, I'm like, there's false bottom. I opened it up. I throw the weed in there, close it up, boom. And now it's another three weeks before we head back to Portsmouth, and we're all very nervous. I actually had a couple joints on me. I would smoke out to sea off the stern of the ship in the middle of the night. I would be puffing, take a couple, three drags, somebody comes, throw it overboard, you know? But it would be great because then you're out on a ship in the middle of the ocean high. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Right? Lots of nice starry nights. Starry nights. Yeah, Yeah, totally. So anyways, we're headed back. We're finally done with the patrol. We're headed up up the coast. So we're about 10 miles offshore from Portsmouth on the outer banks of the Isle of Shoals. And suddenly, there was an electrical fire in the aft steering compartment, the all the way aft to the back of the ship steering compartment where the rudder moves. You can actually see it. It's a huge rudder. I mean, this is a big ship, right? And it was an electrical fire, not a big deal. Guy on duty runs back. He sees the electrical fire. I mean, it's not good, but it's not going to destroy the ship, hopefully, because luckily he has a CO2 fire extinguisher right there. Grabs a CO2 fire extinguisher, pulls the pin, out comes the CO2 and a bag of weed. (laughs) (laughs) And basically explodes. The bag of weed explodes sort of. Yeah, I guess it would explode. It was... Like splatter painted? Yeah. The I didn't get to see this part of it because that was not my department because it was the engineer. There are three of us deckies, the three sailors, and a, see, you're called a seaman, okay? Yeah. But if you work below decks in the engineering department, you're called a fireman, okay? That's in both the Navy and the Coast Guard. So we were, three of us were seamen, and the third, fourth guy was a fireman. And that's where he thought, uh, we also called them snipes, derogatorily, would be a snipe, would be an engine room person. And we were always like, we're, you know, the poets and dreamers were in the deck force, right? So we're like those knuckleheads down there. And especially in this case, it's like, why would you put the weed in the horn of a fire extinguisher? That just seems like the lamest place right. to stash it, right. right? You're really rolling the dice on not having a fire there. Yeah. And and just, I mean, I don't know. It, it, it was like he didn't think about it very much, you know? And the rest of us obviously did. But of course, we're not talking about this, right? But suddenly, the captain orders the anchor dropped. Now, the families, the wives and kids are expecting us back. Now, I'm single, so it doesn't matter to me, right? But like, they've been waiting for us to come back for two months. And, you know, let's say we're supposed to show up at noontime. That was probably the estimated time of arrival. That to then call the Coast Guard station in Portsmouth and say, listen, we're not going to be in today. Tell the wives and children or whatever to go home because, you know, something's happening out here. They didn't say what it was. Meanwhile, they send a message. We're on anchor now, 10 miles off. They send a message to Coast Guard District 1 in Boston headquarters and say, listen, what? This is what happened. Can you send? And I laugh when I say it, but CGI, Coast Guard Intelligence, we always used to say, there's no such thing. But that's, a, that's a, you know, the Coast Guard Intelligence was the cops of the Coast Guard. Okay. So they, we're on the hook. They send out a couple dudes. 
I don't know. Did they search the ship? I, I can't remember. Honestly, Ruth, I can't remember because I was so friggin' scared, right? Because none of us can even mention to the other, what happened? We, we can't say, who's the idiot that put the weed? And so, a very tense time period there. And But uh, thank goodness for the Coast Guard training on how to hide things. See, the fireman didn't take that class. He didn't get the training we got. We got how to look for stashed things, and we twisted it around, right? So, so he didn't get it. So I guess I've been hard on him for 30 years now. I've been hard on him. He just didn't have the knowledge that we had. Well, what were the repercussions from... Well, thankfully, the Coast Guard intelligence couldn't find the weed, all right? They couldn't find anything. So then they get off the ship and we head back in. So now it's like we're delayed 12 hours or 14 hours. We pull in the next morning. And the executive officer, the XO, and the captain are having this very heated debate that is overheard by one of the mess cooks, who's like the lower echelon guys that cleans up. Right, so he's eavesdropping because to like higher ups, these guys are invisible. They don't see the servants, right? So they eavesdrop all the time on stuff. So, anyways, this fellow's listening to the captain and XO have this argument. How the captain wants to drug test the entire ship, an eighty man crew, to find out who's been using marijuana, but the executive officer is saying eighty guys at sixty dollars a test. We can't afford that. And then the captain says, well, we'll request extra money from District 1. And the XO says, Captain, I don't think it's in our best interest to tell District 1 that we want to drug test our entire ship. That's not going to look right. That's not going to look right. It's going to make us look really bad. The captain hemmed and hawed and finally decided, okay, we're not going to, we can't do a massive 60 or 80 man drug test. And we're granted liberty, which means you're allowed off the ship. We're tied up. The wives and kids are there. Everybody's done. So we're like, we're gathered by the dumpster and we figure out between three of us that it's the fourth guy. And we're like, oh. So he comes off the ship and they're like, and we're just totally razzing him, right? Just giving him so much grief <laughs> uh, because he was such an idiot about it and risked a lot for us all over an ounce or four ounces of weed. So, and then, you know, we're, we finally get to somebody's apartment and we've got the weed and stuff like that and the four of us are there talking. Oh, so you guys went back on board or you had yeah, taken it off? Yeah, we taken it off. We'd taken it off. I'd okay. actually just taken it off, put it in my pants, walked, I walked right by the drug dog with the bag of weed in my pants. Didn't flag you at all? Wow. Wow. I mean, she wasn't even, you know, they have to be on point almost to be doing that. Their handler's doing certain things. She yeah. just kicked back, you know. Right. So uh, we went to somebody's house. We actually went to this uh, two sisters at our apartment. We'd hang out with them. When we got there and we have all this bag of weed now, we're at the safe, safe spot. And the guy who lost his weed now doesn't have any weed. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and he, the one who cut the hole and in the insulation, the smartest one, he says, okay, I'll sell you an eighth of my weed. And then, you know, okay, how much? He's like, 25 bucks. And we paid 25 bucks an ounce. We, we got a quarter pound for 100, <laughs> which is still outrageous down there. I mean, that was, that was very expensive weed. Yeah. So anyways, we sold him an eighth of his ounce and covered the cost. Right. <laughs> In the Trees Cannabis Podcast would like to thank the Maine Cannabis Chronicle for sponsoring the show. If you haven't had the opportunity to check out their magazine, you should ask your local caregiver store, dispensary, or grow store if they have a copy of it. If they don't, request that they carry it. The Maine Cannabis Chronicle is a great source of knowledge on all things related to the high quality herb here in Maine. This is a beautifully edited, full-color, well-done magazine full of captivating articles from some of the best in the business today. Grab a copy and give it a read. (laughs) 
Many thanks out to Crash Berry for sharing this entertaining and well-crafted Stony story with us on our first special feature episode. I hope you all enjoyed it. Crucial thanks out to High Striker Farms for the cherry strudel hash rosin. Crash loved the taste and clearly got some nice inspiration from it. You can find Crash Berry's books at fine booksellers like Gulf of Maine Books in Brunswick, Longfellow Books in Portland, or if you can't shop locally, check on Amazon by searching his name. We hope you enjoyed this special feature episode, and if you especially liked it, let us know in the comments at inthetreespodcast.com forward slash episodes. In the Trees listeners, if you or anyone you know has a great stony story to share, please write to us at inthetreespodcast at gmail.com or click the Get At Us tab on our website, inthetreespodcast.com. We all love a good story, especially one with some great herb, and we would love to hear from you. Please visit our website, inthetreespodcast.com, for bonus audio and video content, including more stony stories, our well-loved blog, and behind-the-scenes features unaired on the show. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel, rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, or download us on Spotify. We want to deliver you more great audio and video content, and your support is greatly appreciated. If you would like to become a patron for In the Trees to show even more love and support, you can click the Donate tab on our website, which is linked to PayPal and Venmo, or you can look us up on Patreon under In the Trees Podcast and feel free to donate to the show. In the Trees Podcast is a labor of love, and our team is committed to providing you a quality show. We are so grateful for your show donations and Patreon support. They allow us to continue providing fun and educational podcast episodes like the one you just listened to and maybe get some better mics and equipment for the studio. Apart from having access to a ton of behind the scenes audio and video, including raw cuts of myself and guests talking about things your kids might need earmuffs for, Patreon supporters also get the opportunity to score a pack of cannabis seeds from intentional crosses that I made in one of my own gardens which are for tossing in your smoothie or feeding to your cockatiel. 